Okay, so yeah, we're, we're going to talk about um, running programming languages on top of the beam here. Um, in this case, it's language which don't have the outline semantics. Uh, most of them, well, the ones we'll be talking about, that they have shared, amongst other things, they have shared global mutable data, which neither the airline nor the beam can handle. So we're not going to be talking about Elixir. We're not going to be talking about uh, LFE or Clojure or Gleam or Alpaca or Ephim or a lot of other languages that have come along um, on top of the on top of the beam and the Allen system. And some are, of course, in, um, in use, constant use. But we're not going to be talking about those. We'll be talking about other languages instead. So can you flip us down? Well, Manuel? Manuel, can you change slides? Yeah, sorry. So uh, these, these languages have, have a number of problems. I mean, same as any language, they have the problems of syntax and parsing. And um, also because they're be going to be having a different memory model, they have problems of um, handling data on top of the, um, the beam and the outline system. They also have also have problems with, well, they can also have problems with runtime semantics and things like this, which have to be implemented. So yeah. Um, I will start very quickly about one slide about um, syntax and parsing here. Um, yeah, go down. Yeah, so um, often, I mean, there, there are a couple of tools in the, in the standard Erlang OTP system for doing syntax and parsing. There's leaks for tokenizing and yex for parsing. And sometimes we can use those. Other times we will, um, you, you, they can't, they just don't fit in. So you'll have to write special parsers peg or custom parsers, and we'll be talking about those. Uh, Luel, we can use both, well, for Luel, well, posh back, we're gonna be talking about two, give two examples here, Luel and uh, EPHP. And in Luel, we can use leaks and yek, whereas each PH, EPHP uses a custom parser based on peg. So yeah, leaks. Leaks, it's a lexical scanner generator. Um, it's based on LexFlex, the same ideas as in LexFlex, but simpler. And it uses regular expressions to define tokens. Um, these aren't the regular same, same regular expressions as in the RE module, but they are, they are simpler and they have the benefit that they are non determinable They are completely deterministic. So there's never any backtracking for it to, to use them. And we can, which means we can make a very efficient, um, tokenizer. Um, it generates scanning functions, two sets of them. One, one for direct use, just a string. You pass in a string and then you get back the tokens. Or there are a couple which make it fit into the standard Erlang IO system. Uh, one function called token, which returns the next token, or tokens, which returns a list of tokens so far. Um, so yeah, if you look at the next slide, I have a very simple example of using leaks here, or of leaks here. So this is a simple little to tokenizer. It can tokenize names and they are, so, well, sorry, we, we had, can define some macro type things here. So we define U for upper, uppercase letters, L for lowercase letters and D for digits. And then we have a set of rules and we can see the first rule here. That is, it either starts with an upper or a lowercase letter and then has zero or one upper lowercase letters or digits, or we allow the underscore. And if the next token matches that, we get, we're going to make this, uh, then we show what we return, we return a token, and the token we're gonna to call this a name, we get which line it's on, and we return that as an atom. So this is just for parsing names for things for atoms. Uh, the next one is for parsing digits. We only have integers in this very simple case here. They either start with a plus or a minus, or have a, um, one or more digits after that. And then again, we say I'm gonna return a token, and we're going to return a number and we're going to well include the line again, of course, and we're going to return the integer value. And then we have a set of tokens in the third case here, uh, semicolon equals the parentheses, star, slash, plus and minus. Um, we're going to accept these tokens as well. And we're just going to return uh, one of these as a, their own class and their own class in themselves and the line they're on. We'll see in the parser how we're going to use this. 
And then we're going to say that the last two handles things we're going to skip. So anything, any, any, or any control characters less than space, we're going to skip those. And we're going to skip um, th things that start with a hash and up, up, to, up to the new line, up to and including a new line. We're going to skip those with we, so we can use those as token, as comments. So this is a very simple little tokenizer here. We, we, we can use this to generate a small little language for them. So yeah, the next. So as a, as a parser generator, we're going to use Yik, which is one of the standard parser. It's a standard parser generator that comes with the OTP system. Um, it's an LALR1 parser. It's based on Yak. It can handle the same type of gen, um, um, grammars as Yak can. And when you build it, you basically get one function back, which is parse, and you parse in a list of tokens, and then, it, then the parser then returns um, the forms you want it, you, the tokens defined. So if um, we, we skip down, look at, here, here's, here, well, here's a very simple grammar for handling the other tokens for token generator, our, our scanner, our leak scanner generated. So we can say which terminals we have. We've got the plus, the minus, the star, the slash, the parentheses, the number, and the var. And we've got non-terminals, we've got structures we're going to build here. It's a statement, an expression, a term, or a function. We're going to start with a statement. And then we can look at the definitions. So we can see here a statement. It's either, if we look here on the first line, it's either an expression, in which case we just return that expression, or it can be a name equals an expression, and then we build, we, we we tokenize the name and the expression and we return an assign. Now an expression can either be an expression plus a term or expression minus a term and then we generate um, tuples describing those with a plus and the minus or it can just be a term and we return that. And uh, we see here we've got these variables dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, etc. Um, they're, they're atoms but they are um, um, accepted as variables in by the ek so the assign here says dollar one that's the first that's the first thing we the first thing we matched here which was a name and dollar three is the expression so that's what we're building these up and the same with the plus here we're doing we're going to return plus dollar one and dollar three which is the expression and the term and the same thing with the minus or if we just have the term it's just dollar one uh, we can have terms, which are times, term times a functor, or term slash a functor. And again, we build up structures representing that. Or the term can just be a functor. And a functor here, that can be a parenthesis and an expression. So we can have a parenthesized expression in there, and we just return that expression. Or it can be a number, or it can be name, and we return that. So this is a very simple little um, uh, grammar we've defined here. We've defined a tokenizer for it, and we've defined a, a parser for it for a simple little, um, very simple little DSL, which we can then use to implement things. Um, typically, they'll be much more complex, and the Luol one, which I won't be showing later, but is much more complex, but it uses exactly the same basic ideas as this. So, yeah, next. Now. Okay. Now, uh, how about the PEG? Uh, well, this is a uh, stay for pairs in expression grammars. That is another way to perform this. Uh, instead of uh, perform the analysis of uh, the legs and the, um, the semantical in two steps, uh, this is going to perform uh, the same actions but uh, in only one step. So the parsing is uh, using pretty Routines of uh, memorization, if I say that well, um, and it's using the, the tracking and parsing of uh, the the lines, uh, keeping always uh, the line up and the column that is uh, parsing uh, during all the the code. That is uh, the that are uh, mainly the features that Neotoma, that is a, a library that uh, we could use uh, uh, with Erlang. And of course, uh, with the rest of the languages, some. Uh, for us, so one example. Uh, this is uh, the well, the the other part that I built uh, using PHP uh, for PHP. 
and uh, I put in yellow, uh, you can see the what is uh, like the root because it's the first uh, rule that uh, we have in, in the file. And uh, following that is uh, you can specify uh, some other rules. Uh, the slash is uh, meaning that uh, you can find the, the first part or the second part. So this is meaning that uh, this could be completely empty or we can find a document. So the document is uh, defined in the following one. And it's using something similar to regular expressions. Uh, it's uh, a bit more different, but uh, in base is uh, regular expressions that it is final uh, or uh, a specification uh, to be matching uh, with the following uh, matching elements that are could be found uh, in the in the rule. So inside of uh, the tildes, uh, we can put the uh, Erlang code that is uh, matching the node, that is uh, the whole thing that we have uh, above. Um, in this case, uh, for example, if we match uh, with the node, uh, we can perform some specific uh, pattern matching uh, to realize if uh, the first part, the second, the third is uh, what is matching and then they get uh, specifically uh, what we want to get uh, from the parsing. But uh, well, for PHP, I have to drop uh, PEG because uh, of the problem parsing. Um, uh, that is uh, the way that uh, PHP led uh, to the, the developers to indicate uh, some free text, uh, putting one specific word. Uh, at the beginning, and then the, everything that is uh, until the uh, found is again the same word in a whole line. Uh, that text is inside of uh, the variable as a uh, normal text. So the problem is uh, that word could be changed. So the parsing using uh, Neotoma or uh, the normal. Uh, parsing the systems uh, was not possible. So I have to implement uh, my own. So EPHP is using a, a custom um, parsing uh, system based on the, the matching of the binaries using facility from, from Ireland. Something like this. For example, for the document that we saw previously, if it's empty, that it was one of the rules, is uh, returning everything and uh, uh, avoiding the uh, continue with the, the, the iteration or the recursivity. And if it's uh, matching against the, the initial tag or everything else, so it's uh, changing the level and going to uh, other specific rules. <clears throat> so uh, I found that uh, this was uh, faster than the use in path, uh, taking the advantage of the pattern matching, uh, taking advantage even the, the facility of the binaries that, that is uh, using the same binary even we are uh, and solves the hair doc issue easily. So that was uh, very good. But uh, the problem is uh, something like the shutting jar, the, the algorithm that is solving the, for example, the algorithm, uh, the, um, the arithmetic uh, equation, when you write uh, only one plus two, for example. Uh, the way to get that and put it as uh, an operation and uh, recognize that as an operation and uh, uh, now that uh, the multiplication is uh, a priority to a sum that is uh, previous uh, uh, or later than the, that operation, uh, that should be uh, included like uh, this uh, kind of algorithm. So I had to develop it by myself. Of course, I copied it from other place, but uh, I had to adapt it uh, from the specific uh, process I was uh, implementing. And that was uh, more or less uh, one of the difficulties uh, I found uh, doing, doing it by myself. So 
Well, the memory management, uh, we have uh, that uh, the, the languages uh, that we developed, uh, uh, both uh, Robert and I, uh, have the, the feature that uh, has a uh, mutable and shared state and global variables and it's completely different as uh, Erlang does. So uh, we couldn't uh, compile this directly to Erlang. So we have to interpret uh, or uh, yeah, interpret uh, that code uh, when the, that was compiled. Uh, so we created, uh, in my case, I created something like an interpreter, uh, but uh, of course it's like a virtual machine. And in Lua, you can see something that is uh, called the virtual machine that is in charge of uh, uh, running line by line uh, the code that is uh, uh, that was uh, parsing in the previous uh, steps and uh, keeping the state, uh, returning that, uh, uh, putting that as a parameter and returning the, for the execution for the next line. Of course, uh, in my case, uh, for example, I was trying to to perform some benchmarks uh, against uh, the real PHP and the execution of PHP that uh, I was uh, interpreting. And uh, well, because uh, PHP is uh, developed in C and uh, the code that I was uh, implementing was on top of Erlang and implemented as an interpreter, that uh, was uh, um, at the beginning the 1000 of uh, times uh, worse and uh, changing some specific things inside, I reduced until 100 of uh, times uh, worse. But uh, I have to say that uh, that is only in some specific uh, operations because uh, most of the functions are implemented on Erlang in a native way. Uh, so only in the case that uh, you are iterating a lot of numbers or doing a lot of iteration or a lot of uh, execution in the PHP code, that is uh, very relevant, but not uh, when you are using the functions and the, you are, for example, attending a call or performing some conver conversions or using some specific JSON code. So, uh, yeah, I try, I think uh, Robert also did uh, try ETS and uh, I hope that uh, that could solve uh, most of my issues, but uh, it didn't. So I continue using the process dictionary. So, Robert? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, Luo, um, if you, you can step down. Um, so, it, it implements Lua. And Lua, as they call, as they say themselves, is a powerful, efficient, lightweight, embeddable scripting language that supports procedural programming, object oriented programming, functional programming, data driven programming, and data description. Basically, they say it can do everything. Um, well, it can in a way. It's actually a very simple, neat little imperative language. It's, dyna it's dynamic, so you can load code while the system is running. It's lexically scoped. It's got mutable variables, mutable environments, mutable global data, and it's quite often used as a common scripting language in games, well, actually. So go to the next one. Um, yeah, so the trouble here was we had to implement the mutable global data using immutable local data which Alan provides. And the only way, that, or the best way I found you could do this is, is have one data structure containing everything which you explicitly thread through the whole system while you're inventing it. So it's got the global tables. That they're, they're the um, data structure that Lua provides. It's got frames. So some frames are global. They have to be in the global frames. It's got environments. You have to keep the current stack, the global user data stored, and everything like this has to be kept um, explicitly kept in this structure, which we then thread through the, the whole system. And because it's it's, an, it's um, a dynamic language, it creates data. So we had to implement our own garbage collector on top of our language collector for handling Lua's state. That actually was much simpler than it looked, but it um, it had to be done for it. So we, we, we are implementing a memory layer in between the language, which the language uses um, and, and the Erlang, Erlang data, data implementations, the data structures. 
Um, it, my system was a simple virtual machine. So there's a compiler and a compiling down to a virtual machine. That was pretty straightforward. It's reasonably close to what the standard one is. But the main problem was the data structure, um, uh, was handling the data structures. So if you go down next. So if you, next slide. Um, yeah, this is the state that's carried around. So the, t the top four are structures for, for, for the uh, for common shared structures, it's the table, the environment, the user data, the functions. Um, we could not use our lang, we could not compile down to our lang code because the way Lua handles code is completely different. It's much more dynamic. And that would totally collide with uh, how Alan handles data structures. So we can't use keep code in modules, we keep it in the data structure. Uh, G here, that's the top level global table which refers to all other tables. We've got the stack and the call stack, data types. We need a random state, uh, random number for generating a unique tag for it. So this is this state we thread through everything and update. So every time you, uh, you change something in a table, you go in here and you find that table, you update that table and you put the updated version back into that structure, which you then pass around um, to the next time things are updated. And I think a lot of the, it's slower of course, Lua is slower than Lua, the standard Lua. And I think a lot of this comes from um, having to manage data in this way. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's, Okay. <laughs> well, I was uh, thinking about to put like uh, you Robert the uh, the internal uh, representation of the data, but uh, it's uh, too big in my case uh, because uh, I try to simulate the whole behavior of uh, uh, PHP and uh, have full control from Erlang. Uh, for example, uh, the use of the configuration that uh, is being able to read the typical PHP dot or the, the streams that uh, have uh, the possibility to read uh, an external HTTP, F, FTP, and uh, a local files um, from the file system. But uh, putting some specific security, I was uh, uh, controlling, for example, the part of the file to don't be accessed directly, the, that uh, you can control the, what part of the directory of the files are accessible. And uh, the output is uh, in the same way completely um, because uh, PHP uh, is a templated language. So the uh, strange is uh, you put uh, some specific code and you get the output. The most important part of the execution of PHP is the output that is generated. And it's important that uh, you can uh, recite that output in the way uh, you want. So you can implement your own handler for the output or only retrieve the binary that is uh, generated at uh, the output. And the errors uh, has the, the facility because of the configuration to drop the errors to the output um, or drop it uh, to the logs or whatever else. And in the part of the code, uh, you have uh, the uh, weird things of the constants that uh, I try a couple of times uh, to put it inside the code, but uh, later I had to create a table specifically for them because uh, uh, because of the way of including the code uh, for PHP, uh, you can include uh, in a dynamic way the following files uh, to be complete in your code. So you can add uh, in the runtime constants uh, and of course functions, uh, other files, Object classes and the variables that is uh, the, that was the most difficult part because even PHP has uh, references uh, for other variables and uh, the garbage collecting was uh, a bit nightmare <laughs> uh, to keep in mind that uh, that it was not removing a variable that was referred to, to a, another in another place inside of another function object or whatever. Uh, so uh, uh, the files that uh, was created, uh, no, yeah, uh, the files that, that was created inside of uh, PHP uh, was uh, referring to uh, the, the the whole part of uh, the those specific part uh, those specific balls that, uh, for example, there is a specific file for constants or for variables. And if you read the code, it's uh, split it in those specific uh, areas. And the context, that is uh, the big one, 
is a, uh, which is uh, containing everything inside. Uh, the red ones are a bit uh, out because uh, you can complete it and the flag has some specific uh, handles uh, for the errors, uh, for the configuration, as I say, for the output and even include more stream. So, well, the, the internal organization of uh, PHP is uh, to be living inside of uh, a process of uh, Erlang. So if you want to create, uh, for example, uh, when you have a, a web uh, con connection, you have the possibility to create uh, one process each time you have to attend uh, a request. And uh, this is uh, isolating the, the whole thing uh, from the other processes. So it's uh, keeping secure uh, the, the handling of everything that is inside of uh, the PHP interpreter. And um, well, uh, I think that's all, yeah. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Excellent, awesome talk, very interesting to see what challenges we may see when implementing something custom on top for, of the BIM. Uh, we have first question, which I will read out loud. Mm, parse transformations are used if a programmer wants to use Erlang syntax, but with different semantics. If I would like to extend my .erl module with a new non-Erlang syntax, where should I start? Um, parse transforms, they, they pre preserve, actually preserve the Erlang syntax. So if you want to make a new syntax, you have to write your own, your own parser in front of it. Now that parser can generate the same abstract syntax as, as the Erlang does, if it wants to. Um, and then you can pass it into the compiler, but you, you, you can't, the parse transforms don't help you there because they work with our syntax and they generate our syntax. So you have, you have to write in that case, write your own parser, your own parser front end and then plug it in, which is perfectly possible to do because the compiler is very, um, um, open in that sense. So where should I start then? Uh, like, can you maybe point to where the compiler can be extended or what um, about it? You, you can, the way, I mean, uh, you, you can start the compiler, run the compiler in such a way that you don't pass in a file and it does the parsing and, and the, the parsing of that file, but you can write your own parser, parse the file yourself and then call the compiler with what your parser has generated. The mm -hmm. compiler is perfectly open to do that. It's, it's, it, you call the function called forms, compile call on forms, and that, that takes the parse thing and then runs it into the, um, the Erlang compiler. It assumes you're generating the same Erlang abstract syntax, but it has no, it does, doesn't care what the syntax actually, well, that Erlang abstract syntax, but it doesn't care what your, uh, your real syntax looks like. Just the same, it generates the same thing. I do that for another language. I mean, that, that's exactly what Elixir does, basically. It has its own parser, and then in the end, it generates Erlang, uh, Erlang, Erlang abstract syntax. Okay, good. And uh, we have another question from Zvi. I will try to unmute you, Zvi, and maybe you can ask this uh, yourself. Let's give it a try. You are now unmuted. Zvi? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you ask your question, please? I, I can't hear. I will read it out then, sorry before. This, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, the question is to Emmanuel. Did anyone try to port production PHP web application to ePHP? Uh, I have it uh, running, but uh, not as a whole theme, but uh, it's uh, as a, a template handling uh, for Phoenix Ringworks. Uh, so instead of using the EEX that is available for Elixir, uh, I was uh, I published it uh, uh, last year or a bit uh, earlier uh, an extension that uh, you can use uh, with <coughs> Phoenix Framework, and instead to use uh, the typical syntax uh, for Elixir, you can use uh, PHP. And I did it because uh, I was working with a designer that uh, only wanted to write the uh, templates in PHP. So uh, I have not uh, uh, my my wish was not to fight mm -hmm. with him. So. <laughs> 
I put that available, so he was uh, writing in PHP and uh, I was using in that list. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have now David, I tried to unmute David. Can you please ask your question? Hello, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you yeah. very well. Okay, uh, so my question is, what's the use case of running PHP or Lua on the Beam? I mean, those languages already run on their own machines. Um, I, can, I can answer for the Lua is that it is much, one, you have a much closer connection with the Erlang system because you're running, it's implemented and running on top of Erlang. It also means I, I can run thousands of Luas, separate, separate Lua instances. I don't have to have one Lua instance outside and keep track of what it's doing and things like this, or, or very few of them. But from the Erlang point of view, it's just Erlang code. So I, I can run many, I can run many of them. And it's, it's purely local um, for it. And as I said, the interface between Lua, or Lua in this case, and Erlang is very tight in that sense. Yeah, I think it's a, a mix in between the put the, the power of Erlang that, that uh, you can create uh, as many processes as you need, mm -hmm. and the facility of uh, have something that is uh, interpreted in runtime, and uh, it's possible to be changed uh, faster than the uh, compile it again and put it in production. And uh, well, in the case of PHP, for example, it uh, was uh, a facility to get uh, another syntax uh, to write uh, websites. So it's uh, like an extension. Yeah, I can just a final comment with the thousands of process. I can't show the example here, but I have a very simple demo example uh, running in the world with running spaceships. And the spaceship logic is written in, in uh, Lua. And you can quite happily run 2,000 spaceships. Um, and while it's running, upgrade the code and things like this for it. And that, of course, is perfectly possible to do if you use an ex the standard law, but then you have to keep track of all these, these spaceships explicitly. Here, I don't have to do that because they're running in separate processes with separate data. It's just the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. And another question uh, to Robert. Uh, what approach would you suggest for implementing DSLs and mini query languages? Um, I would basically do what we've been doing here. You need to define your own syntax one in, or use an existing one, one, inch, one which is suitable for what your language wants to, to do or needs to do for expressing it. Then you implement the syntax for it, either using, well, either the way I did or, or the way Manuel did it, depending on the syntax. And you can either write an interpreter for that, or you can compile it down. And then, then, you, then you run that on top of the outline system. Um, that I think is the best way of doing it. Um, then you'll get your language. I mean, however you look at it, whichever syntax you, you take, it's generally not good for everything. So in that sense, define, just designing your own syntax, excuse me, and implementing, I think, is the way to go there if you want to make a DSL. Mm -hmm. You could write a DSL in our language. We could write it in any other language you want, for example. But then, then it might be difficult to express what you want to express in a nice way in that, to put it this way. OK. I think that if you want to implement queries, uh, you can check uh, QLC. That is a good implementation for query the amnesia. And this using the list uh, uh, compressions and, uh, to get the easier way to make queries in a Erlang language. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Thank you for I'll that. just say as final comment, the little language I just, I showed here with leaks and yek, it's very easy to write a little interpreter for that. And then, then you have then you have your DSL. Okay, this is a very limited case, but uh, that's just a very simple way of get going going forward. Um, to see if, how you want to do if if what you want is if what you get is what you want or need. <laughs>